Okay, hi everyone. Good morning. Welcome to the Topos Colloquium. Today we are very honored and pleased to have Mike, uh, Michael Levin, Levin, who's going to be talking to us about uh, emergent selves uh, and unconventional intelligences where philosophy and engineering meet. Uh, so uh, Mike, whenever you're ready, thank you so much. Cool. Thank you. Uh, and thank you very much for, for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to um, share some ideas with you. Um, if anybody wants to uh, uh, find any of the information later or contact me, all of the uh, really uh, rigorous academic stuff is here at this website. And then here you can register um, to be kept apprised of various things. And here uh, eventually there'll be some, some thoughts that are adjacent to, uh, to things I can actually um, provide good evidence for. So some essays and things like that. So um, my group does a number of different things. And kind of on our best day, what I think we do is go from uh, figuring out our, our, uh, our views on some, some deep philosophical issues and moving them towards uh, empirical and hopefully even clinical outcomes. So we're very interested in that whole, um, that whole stack from, from, from very fundamental ideas to uh, practical applications. And uh, today, one of the uh, central themes we'll talk about is this, this, this concept of a self and how it, uh, how it helps that mission. And we'll talk about um, a, number of, a number of issues related to what I think is maybe the most profound process in, in science and philosophy, which is developmental biology. So uh, all of us were once a little blob of physics and chemistry. We were a quiescent oocyte. Uh, people look at that and they say, well, that's just physics. I hate that phrase, but, but often people will say that it's just physics and chemistry. And then eventually we become one of these things or maybe even something like this. And, uh, and it's really critical to note that this process is smooth and continuous. So there is no uh, special time where there's some kind of magic lightning flash and it says, okay, you used to be physics and chemistry, but now you're a mind. So, so this, is, this is a smooth, continuous process and we really need to understand this. And, uh, and this, this, this journey from, from, uh, from simple physics to, to what we call uh, cognitive processes involves a number of uh, philosophical issues such as these. All of this kind of stuff is gonna uh, pop up today during the talk, including uh, really uh, moving beyond uh, just emergence and complexity, but actually the appearance of, of agency, which is different. It's, it's not just complexity. So um, here are the main points that I'd like to transmit today. First, um, I work on a, uh, on, a, on a framework that I've, uh, that I've been developing called TAME, Technological Approach to Mind Everywhere, which is basically an observer-based uh, kind of uh, intersection of biology, cognitive science, and computer science. Um, I, I will try to show that the philosophy actually matters. It drives new discoveries. And my goal is not just prediction. That is, somebody prepares an interesting system for you, and you're able to make predictions of what it's going to do next. I'm interested in something I call pre-invention, which is this issue of what, what, what new ideas and, and experiments and capabilities does your philosophical outlook provide? So, so, so not just predicting what a system will do, but actually, how did you, how did you make that system in the first place? Where do um, inventions come from and so on? Um, I'm gonna use anatomical control as an example of some of these ideas. So, so the collective intelligence of cells that are navigating a kind of anatomical morphous space. And I'm going to tell you that uh, bioelectrical networks uh, are the protocognitive medium, basically the ancestor of, of, of brain function, uh, that uh, that underlies the um, the intelligent uh, behavior of of the collective collectives of cells, and 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 I'll show you some practical impacts in biomedicine and so on. Uh, towards the end, I'll talk about synthetic bioengineering and a huge option space of new bodies and new minds that don't have standard evolutionary backstories. And this provides a lot of uh, fodder for thinking about implications uh, to, uh, on evolution, biomedicine, robotics, AI, and ethics. Uh, and, and at the very end, if there's time, I'll talk about um, these synthetic kinds of beings as a sort of exploration tool, uh, as a kind of periscope for some kind of latent space of possibilities of form and function. So I often start out with this. This is a, a, a well-known uh, painting of uh, Adam naming the animals in the Garden of Eden. And there's a couple of interesting things here. One is that this, this sort of older view, which really still permeates a lot of discussion today, uh, that there are these natural kinds. We know what a human is. We know what these other, uh, these other things are. They're different, they're discrete, and we can say how they're different. And there's this, there's this special category of, of, of human. Uh, the other interesting thing about this is that in the original story in the Jewish tradition, it's, it's up to Adam to name the animals. God didn't do it. The angels couldn't do it. It's, it's really on the human in this picture to name the animals. And I think that's pretty profound because, uh, as you'll see by the end of this talk, I think we are going to have to get good at naming, specifically um, 
uh, uh, learning the the uh, the ultimate the uh, kind of essential uh, the essential essence of uh, of a wide variety of new unconventional beings. We're we're going to have to do this uh, soon. Um, and so so one thing that we need to understand is that this this uh, so-called human is actually. Uh, one point on a very long continuum, and so so we know this evolutionarily. And so, if you think that humans have some kind of a space, um, a, a special uh, agential glow about them, they um, they have true uh, cognition and and uh, and various kind of mental qualities, and they're responsible for their actions and things like that. Uh, you have to sort of ask yourself, where does this agential glow kind of peter out, or are you willing to draw a line somewhere? And if so, how do you justify that line? Not only on an evolutionary timescale but we are also part of a continuum on our own individual time scale. So we start life as an egg and then eventually, uh, you know, whatever properties you want to assign to this creature, you have to ask, where do they come from in this, uh, in this continuum? And so, so that, that can actually lead to some, some interesting, uh, interesting issues, but it actually gets even worse, which is that we are also part of another continuum, which is the fact that life is so interoperable means that we can make small or very large changes either biologically or technologically and at every level of organization we can introduce uh, designed materials uh, we can make hybrids and uh, various chimeras and so all of all of these kinds of things if if the, this is stretch this category of what exactly you think a human is and do you really think that it has something to do with with the genetics or the anatomy and we can we can talk about that towards towards the end so what uh, what i'm interested in is developing a framework to help us recognize, engineer, and ethically relate to um, truly diverse intelligences. So that means not just the familiar uh, primates and maybe whales and maybe octopus and things like that, but actually some really weird creatures such as colonial organisms and swarms, uh, engineered new life forms, artificial intelligences, <clears throat> and maybe someday exobiological agents. And of course, I'm not the first person to, to try for this. So, so this is uh, Wiener, uh, Rosenbluth, and Bigelow's uh, kind of scale here, going from basically passive matter all the way up to uh, complex human level second order metacognition. And, and he's trying to point, the, 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 this, this paper tries to point out that um, there's something, uh, there's, a, there's a continuum to be defined here with, with various waypoints along that continuum. And I think that any uh, framework that, that we come up for, the, with, for this purpose has to not just be a philosophical um, undertaking, but it actually has to move experimental work forward. We have to uh, link it to uh, actual um, empirical data, and it has to provide new capabilities uh, for, uh, for, for, for discovery and so on. So, so here's, here's my take on it. Um, what, what, the way I tend to think about this is from an observer's point of view, and that observer can be the system itself, but uh, any system is somewhere on this continuum of uh, this axis of persuadability. So, so when I emphasize persuadability, and for engineers, of course, creation as well, is that there's, you, you have a system, and as an engineer, uh, or, or as a, as a, as a, as a human, as a friend, or as, as a conspecific or whatever, you would like to know where on this continuum that system is and why it matters is because your choice of your, your decision as to where it is, uh, constrains what tools you're going to use to interact with that system. And there are many different kinds of systems that admit to basically only hardware modification, right? For these kinds of systems, you're not going to convince them of anything. You're not going to reward or punish them, but as you get up here, you can change set points. Uh, and you can provide rewards and punishments, and you can provide cogent reasons. And you know, at this, at the, this is this is traditional engineering down here, and this is this ranges across various cybernetic techniques and techniques of behavior science. And up here, you're actually leveraging the agency of of the other being to uh, to to elevate both of you in some sort of relationship. Um, and so, so one can ask a simple question that we'll we'll, we'll get to uh, shortly, which is. Where do cellular collectives fit into this? So cells, single cells, paramecia, tissues, organs, things like that. And that highlights the fact that this is you, you, you can't just have philosophical commitments to where a given system is here. This is not something you can decide from an armchair. You have to do experiments. That means you have to uh, propose a problem space. You have to propose uh, some uh, set of goals and a cognitive light cone, that, which we'll talk about. And uh, and 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 then you test then you then you test that and you see if if your if your worldview gives you good predictive control. Being too far to the left of the right level and being far too far to the right both end up being suboptimal. It's not just that we always try to skew this way, although some people think that's how we should go. I actually think we we really need to um, find the right level. Going going in the wrong direction uh, this way actually leads to more problems, if anything, than going to uh, too far in this direction. 
so we'll we'll get to this question, kind of some empirical work on this. Okay, so the, so the first thing I want to talk about uh, are these this idea of diverse unconventional um, intelligence, uh, cashing out the notion of intelligence as a kind of problem solving task and navigation in various spaces. Uh, one thing that we might think is that is that while people do talk about collectives, uh, collective intelligences, ant colonies and beehives and things like that. Well, at least we are a real unified intelligence, right? Like we're not, we're not like this, this, these questionable cases of these, these um, liquid minds as Ricard, liquid uh, brains as Ricard Soleil puts it. But actually, and, and oh, and in fact, you know, so, so Descartes really liked the pineal gland because there was only one of them in the brain. And he felt that we, we have this unified perspective as humans, and there should be one structure that corresponds to that in the brain. But if he had had good microscopy, he would have seen that there really isn't one of anything in the brain. What he would find is a bunch of cells inside the pineal gland. And in each, inside each one of those cells, he would find all of this stuff, right? There's a, there's a lot of components here. So, so, so we are all a collective intelligence. We, we're made of parts. And in particular, we're made of a kind of agential material, which looks like this. This is a uh, this happens to be a free living organism, but the, our cells were once uh, free, free living organisms too. This is a lacrimaria. So you can see this, this creature uh, has no brain, no nervous system. It uh, handles all of its uh, local needs at a very small scale, all of its metabolic and anatomical and, and, and so on needs uh, by itself and without having uh, stem cell, cell to cell communication, brains, nervous system, uh, there you go. So, so you can see that, that individual cells have various, uh, various competencies. And in fact, uh, we are made of a kind of multi-scale competency architecture. That is, at each level of organization, we have components that uh, not just structurally sort of nest um, one into the other, but, but are competent at solving goals in various spaces. So uh, we as, as humans are pretty good, not great actually, but pretty good at recognizing intelligence of medium sized objects moving at medium speeds through three-dimensional space. So we can recognize, you know, clever things like this and, and so on. But we're really very bad at recognizing intelligence in other spaces because most of our sense organs point uh, outwards and they are attuned to a specific scale of, of, of um, sp space and time. Uh, for example, if, if I, I think that if we had evolved with a sense organ that faced inwards and gave you a, an immediate um, um, kind of a, a, a taste of, of, uh, of all your blood chemistry, all the different dimensions of your blood chemistry, I think we would have no problem realizing that we live in a high dimensional space, that our liver and our kidneys are intelligent navigators of that space, uh, and, and, and so on. But, but it's really hard for us. We have to develop tools to do that. Um, there are other spaces like transcriptional space, like physiological space, I'm going to spend most of my time talking about morphous space. So the, the space of all possible anatomical configurations of a particular structure. And I want to very quickly give you a couple of examples of, of other problem solving in other spaces. Um, these are planaria, which I'll talk about a lot shortly. Planaria uh, re regenerate various body parts. Uh, in fact, all body parts. And one thing you can do in planaria that we showed a couple of years ago is you can hit them with a solution of barium. Barium is a, a, a non-selective potassium channel blocker. The heads explode uh, because the cell is very unhappy about um, not being able to pass potassium. But if you leave them there for a couple of weeks, they grow new heads and the new heads don't care about barium at all, no problem. And so we looked at which genes are differently, uh, differentially expressed in these new heads versus the old heads. It's only about a dozen genes. And the kicker is that planarian never see barium in the wild. Okay, so they, they, they could not have an evolutionary uh, um, uh, kind of a, 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 you know, provided a set of uh, tools for dealing with this, with this problem. They've, ne they've never seen barium before. So you can imagine out of, let's say, 20,000 or so genes, you have to do this, this walk in this space from where you are now to a region in which you, that will actually solve your physiological stressor, but it's one you've never seen before. So it's this idea of navigating this, this high dimensional transcriptional space to solve uh, a problem that, that you've never seen before. And unlike in a bacterial colony, there isn't time for, sele for a selection um, explanation. It's not that just that, you know, random, all the cells do random things and then somebody survives. There isn't time for any of that. So, so there's some kind of navigation here. Um, not, only can, not only can cellular collectives navigate that space, we also now see that very simple systems like gene regulatory network models can do six different kinds of learning. Uh, including uh, associative conditioning, just just um, by their by the virtue of their dynamical systems properties, without without rewiring them. So there are these various components of uh, of, of behavioral science that can be seen all across from 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 cells, from tissues, organs, and so on. And one thing that we that we play with is this idea that basically what evolution has done is pivot some of the same skills 
some of the same ways of navigating problem spaces across different spaces. So, so initially the earliest life from metabolic and then physiological and then transcriptional and then anatomical, eventually when brains and muscles showed up behavior, so traditional behavior in three-dimensional space and, 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 and more recently, even linguistic. So, so we even have a project looking at um, um, weaving narratives in linguistic space as a kind of navigation that may be quite parallel to some of these other things. And the idea is that each level, uh, it, it's, it's how, can, how can we understand how each level distorts the energy landscape for the lower components to enable them to exert their competencies while the whole thing serves some other goal for the higher level system in some other space that these components don't know anything about. And so in order to look at that, um, the next part of the talk, I wanna uh, devote some attention to this, the collective intelligence of morphogenesis. And we argue that, that, that literally uh, cells undergoing morphogenesis are exerting behavior in anatomical morphospace as a collective intelligence. Now, uh, we know this, this of course needs no introduction. So Alan Turing was really interested in uh, in, in intelligence broadly conceived in, um, in, in minds and in different embodiments, uh, in uh, computation and so on. Uh, and so we know that he was, he was interested in problem solving machines and, and reprogrammability. Interestingly enough, he wrote this paper um, on the chemical basis of morphogenesis. Now, why would somebody who was interested in, in uh, the mathematics of, of, of intelligence be writing a paper on uh, basically uh, or, or the formation of order in chemical embryonic systems? I think he saw a very profound truth uh, that these two processes, the creation of, uh, of a mind and the creation of a body are actually very um, isomorphic and very linked and, and, and really kind of fundamentally the same problem. And this is how we think about this. So, so let's, let's just ask, uh, we start life this way as a collection of blastomeres. Eventually, this is a cross-section through a human torso. You see the amazing order. Everything is in the right place where it's you know, relative to the right thing, the right size and shape and so on. And so um, we can ask, where does this pattern come from? Where is it encoded? And, and traditionally, people will just say, well, it's in the DNA. It's in the, it's in the genome. But we can read genomes now. We know what's in the genome. And the genome doesn't say anything directly about this kind of stuff. The genome specifies the uh, the tiny um, hardware that every cell gets to have, so the protein sequences, um, and then it's the interaction of the cells using that hardware via the physiological um, software that actually gives rise to all of this. And, and th this order is not in the DNA directly any more than the structure of the, um, the termite mound or the shape of a, of a spider's uh, web is directly in the DNA of the, of the uh, termite or the, or the spider. And so we need to understand uh, how do the cell groups know what to build and when to stop? Uh, we need to, as workers in regenerative medicine, we would like to know um, how to repair uh, if something is missing. How do you convince cells to rebuild it? And as engineers, we would like to know what else is possible. Same exact cells, what else could we convince them to build? And so I, I like to think about the end game of our field as something I call the anatomical compiler. This idea that someday uh, you would be able to sit in front of a computer and draw the plant or animal that you want. So, so not at the level of molecular pathways, but, but literally just, just draw the schematic. I want this kind of crazy thing with this three-headed flatworm. And, uh, and if we knew what we were doing, what the system would, would do was compile that description down to a set of uh, stimuli that would have to be given to cells to get them to build exactly this. Now, why do we need this? Uh, besides the, the foundational issues are that... Um, pretty much every medical problem with the exception of infectious disease, uh, so birth defects, traumatic injuries, cancer, aging, degenerative disease, all of these things would go away if we had one simple capability to convince a group of cells to build whatever structure we wanted them to build. Okay, so this is a foundational thing for, for, for medicine. Um, and, and we don't have anything like this. Uh, now, 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 it's really important to, that, that this, this um, anatomical compiler is not a 3D printer. This is a communications device, fundamentally. This is something that converts from, from your goals to the encoded representational uh, set points of a collective intelligence of cells. And I'm going to talk about that. Okay, so, so why don't we have this? I mean, molecular biology and genetics have been going really great for, for decades. Well, we're very good at this kind of stuff. We're very good at figuring out which uh, genes and proteins interact with which other genes and proteins really quite a long way from, from the control of uh, large-scale form and function, as we see in, in all the problems with, uh, with injury and cancer and so on. And so I, I argue that the reason is because uh, molecular medicine is still basically stuck where uh, computer science was in the 40s and 50s. All the excitement today, so CRISPR, genomic editing, protein engineering, 
um, pathway rewiring, all of these things, they're, they're all focused on the hardware, on the biological hardware. And, and, and you can, yeah, you can program like this and we used to, but, but why don't we do this anymore? You know, why, why don't we on your laptop when you want to switch from PowerPoint to, to Microsoft Word, you don't get out your soldering iron and start, and start rewiring is because we've understood uh, that actually there's a lot of excitement at the software level by taking advantage of the computational competencies of the reprogrammability of your uh, medium, you can do a lot more. And I think this is what we're largely missing. We're barely starting to scratch the surface of, and this is, this is the, uh, the, the agential material of biology or the, uh, the intelligence of cells and tissues. So uh, what do I mean by, uh, by intelligence? I like um, William James's definition. So, so James said that intelligence is the ability to reach the same goal by different means. And I don't think this encompasses every facet of intelligence. Of course, there are many other useful definitions, but, but here's what's good about this one. It's a nice cybernetic definition. It doesn't say anything about brains or, or evolution or where you came from. It, uh, it, it talks about um, uh, effective navigation of various spaces uh, with the ability to solve problems, to handle novelty, and to improvise. And James specifically talks about this continuum, which sounds kind of crazy to a lot of people, but I actually think it's, it's right on the money, which is he talks about the distinction between two magnets trying to get together and Romeo and Juliet trying to get together, right? Now, you, now you think these are, these are completely uh, sort of different, different cases, but what they have in common is the fact that when the, these two magnets, uh, if there's a barrier in between, th that's it. All they're ever gonna do is stand there pressed up against the, up against the barrier because they are trying in the short term to, uh, to optimize their, uh, their free energy and so on. Uh, but 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 these the, the, these agents have all kinds of ability to do delayed gratification and go around barriers and so on, and in the middle you have various other types of uh, systems, uh, cells and and animals and autonomous vehicles and all kinds of different policies that have different degrees of the ability to navigate. They might have simple memories. They might have uh, uh, this is all all kinds of uh, different different policies. Maybe they have some planning. Maybe they don't, and so on. So. So, so let's ask, what kind of collective intelligence do cellular swarms deploy? I've, I've made the claim a couple of times that, that cells, the cell groups have a certain intelligence. What does that mean? So let's keep this in mind, the ability to reach the same goal by different means. Well, first of all, basic development, basic embryonic development is quite reliable. Um, almost always you start from an egg, uh, divides and so on, and then you get this uh, normal human uh, anatomy. But actually, if you cut those uh, early embryos into pieces, you don't get two half bodies, you get two perfectly normal monozygotic twins. And so in this state, in this amorphous space, which I've cut down here to two dimensions, this ensemble corresponding to the normal human target morphology, you can get there from this state or from this state, actually from a whole bunch of different states, avoiding various local minima and maxima. So, so you start to see this ability to uh, deal with uh, unexpected perturbations. It is not hardwired to do the same set of steps. By the way, there are, there, are, there are species that actually seem to be pretty hardwired, but the vast majority of them are not. And this is, um, this is not just for development in regeneration. So, so this little guy is called the, uh, the axolotl. They regenerate their jaws, their eyes, their limbs, their tails, uh, including spinal cord, um, ovaries, and so on. And what happens is that if, if, if their limb is amputated anywhere along this axis, it will rapidly rebuild. It will build exactly what's needed, and then it stops. Okay, so there's this kind of homeostasis that tries to rebuild the original um, shape. When does it stop? Well, it stops when the correct salamander arm has been completed. That's kind of that's kind of wild, and that, that's the most amazing part of this whole process is that it stops because you start to see that the system has to actually know what a correct salamander arm uh, looks like. By the way, regeneration is not just for worms and salamanders. Uh, humans have it a little bit. Uh, we, we our livers regenerate. Um, children's fingertips regenerate below a certain age, and deer are a large adult mammal that regrows huge amounts of bone, vasculature, innervation uh, every every year, up to a centimeter and a half per day of new bone growth. So kind of kind of amazing. So, um, and this is this is one of my one of my favorite uh, examples of problem solving. So this is uh, this is a cross section through a uh, a kidney tubule in a newt. And what you see is that there's uh, eight to 10 cells that work together to build this particular structure. One thing you can do uh, experimentally, and this was discovered in the 40s, is um, you, you, can, you can cause these early cells to, uh, to, to, to replicate their genetic material so they have more copies of their genomes. When you do that, the cells become larger. 
When you do that, you get normal newts. So that's amazing thing number one is that you can have two and four and six n and so on uh, newts and, and still get a normal animal with, with, with multiple copies of, this, of the genome. But the cells are larger and what they do is fewer of them will work together to build the exact same structure. So that's amazing thing number two, the cells will actually adapt to their, to their weird new cell size to still give you the exact same thing. The most amazing thing number three is that if you make these cells completely gigantic, one cell will wrap around itself, leaving a space in the middle and still give you the same structure. Now, what's wild about that is that this is a different molecular mechanism. This is cell-to-cell -cell communication and tubulogenesis. This is cytoskeletal uh, bending. So this is a kind of top-down causation in the service of this, this, this need to make a tubule with a large scale anatomical shape that that journey through morphospace space requires you to call on different underlying skills, uh, different underlying molecular mechanisms. So different molecular mechanisms get called up when you need different things to happen. And the amazing thing, if you, if you just sort of think uh, you're, you're a newt uh, coming into this world, I mean, you, you can't count on anything. You, you can't count on having the right number of chromosomes. You can't count on having the right number of cells or the right cell size. You have to be able to make that journey in morphospace space with uh, not only a weird environment, uh, potentially, that's out of your control, not only with various injuries that you might have, but also you can't even rely on your parts. The actual components are unreliable. And so this is very important. And I don't have time to talk about it much, but maybe in the half hour after the talk, we can discuss uh, something that, that we, we've, uh, we've found in our simulations of this process, which is an intelligence ratchet. This idea that evolution, when it's working with an agential material like this that can solve various problems, actually has some very interesting properties over uh, trying to evolve over a passive material. And basically that competency starts to hide information from selection, resulting in improvements in competency, which really, really results, results in this, in this um, intelligence ratchet. Okay, so I wanna, I wanna move now to, re, to uh, dissect a little bit mechanistically, how does this work? How do cellular collectives exert uh, intelligent navigation of morphous space? Um, and all of this is, uh, is gone over in excruciating detail in these, in these kind of papers. So, um, Let's just remind ourselves how this works in three-dimensional space. So, so you have this, you have this rat. The rat has learned an associative memory. You press the lever, you get a reward. But what's interesting about this is that the cells that interact with the lever are this, the skin cells of the paw. The cells that get the reward are somewhere in the intestine that get the sugar. They're not the same cells. There is no single cell that had both experiences. And so in order for there to be an associative memory, you need to think about something that, that's called the rat. It's a, it's a kind of a, a collective being that can synthesize. It can do the credit assignment over its parts. It can synthesize its experience. Uh, and this is a sort of emergent self that owns that associative memory where no individual cell can own that memory. Um, so in order for that to happen, you need some sort of cognitive glue. You need to uh, have something that allows these cells to be bound together into this collective entity that can own new, uh, new information and have preferences and, and memories and so on that the individuals don't have. Um, okay, and so just to, just to remind us uh, what, what the uh, kind of the developmental kind of uh, uh, intelligence uh, that, we, that we need here is this, this is another uh, problem that, uh, that, that, that is solved and, and we discovered this a few years ago where Tadpoles, so this is a tadpole of a frog here, the eyes, the nostrils, the brain, the mouth. Tadpoles, um, in order to become frogs, have to rearrange their face. And uh, you, you might think, and it was thought for a long time, that, that what the genetics gives you is a bunch of hardwired movements. So each organ moves in a particular direction, a particular amount, and you go from being a normal tadpole to being a normal frog. So we decided to test that idea. And so here's, again, this idea of, of, of using empirical testing perturbative experiments in, in morphospace space to ask specific questions about where uh, these, these kinds of systems are on that, on that spectrum of, of, of persuadability. So what we did was create so-called Picasso tadpoles. Everything is in the wrong place. The eyes on the back of the head, the, the jaws are off to the side. It's, it's a mess. And what we found is that these guys actually make quite normal frogs. And that's remarkable because what it means is that the different organs don't just go in the right direction, the right amount, because then starting off in the wrong position, you'd end up in the wrong position. What they actually do is go through novel paths. If they go too far, they actually double back until they end up in the correct frog face. And so what the genetics actually gives you is a very flexible uh, program that um, recognizes uh, unexpected states and uh, is able to minimize the delta between where you are now and where you need to be. And so that raises a critical question. How does it know what is, what is the right pattern? How does it know what the correct uh, face is? 
And so uh, what we, because of that, uh, that uh, the thinking about that, 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 that rat, we started um, thinking about this, uh, this, uh, the, the mechanisms, how that, how that might happen. And basically what, 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 what uh, we have is in addition to this basic, th this is the, this is kind of the basic um, scheme that you have in a developmental biology textbook, which is that uh, it's it's feed forward open loop emergence. So so you have gene regulatory networks. Uh, they make uh, certain kinds of uh, effector proteins, and there's some physics. And these simple local rules result by the process of emergence and complexity in uh, this uh, this amazing pattern. And this is all true. I mean, this does happen, but there's much more to it than this than this simple uh, feed forward emergence because we know that deviations from this pattern, whether by injury, by mutation, by teratogens. Uh, kick on a bunch of um, these kind of feedbacks that uh, that actually exert corrective function, and in order to have this this homeostatic kind of process, right? So 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 one part of this is not uh, terribly surprising. I mean, biologists know about feedback loops and um, and homeostasis and so on, but the part here that's odd is is two things. First, typically when you're thinking about these homeostatic loops, you're thinking of a scalar pH, uh, hunger level, temperature, something like that. This is not that. This the set point here is some complex anatomical structure. Maybe not to the individual cell resolution, but some, but but an anatomical descriptor. Also, uh, you know, we, we're really encouraged um, in 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 uh, in in the sci various science classes grow, well, go, going up. We're really encouraged not to think about final goals. We're really encouraged not to think about systems trying to do anything. We're told that everything is is kind of uh, emergence and complexity, and and we should be we should be explaining things at, at this at this level and 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 watching the the complexity percolate up. Uh, this if 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 correct though this this kind of idea has a very practical consequence, which is that that under the standard paradigm. If you want to make changes at the system level, your only option is to make changes down here to the low-level rules guiding cell behavior, and that's brutal because because this process is not reversible. And figuring out what genes to tweak to make a particular outcome, with the exception of certain low-hanging fruit with single gene diseases and so on, is going to be incredibly hard. That's what is going to limit uh, synthetic biology, CRISPR, all of that. It's it's going to be limited by 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 trying to work this backwards, which actually can't be done. Um, However, if there is this kind of homeostatic uh, uh, set point and, and the ability for the system to follow it, maybe we can just rewrite that set point and let the cells do what they do best. And so that's a very strong prediction of this, this kind of uh, crazy view that, 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 there is, that this is literally a goal-seeking system in the cybernetic sense, not in the magical sense. And it makes this prediction that, that we should be able to find, decode, and rewrite the some kind of uh, set point that is a biophysical um, embodiment, some kind of engram in the in the tissue. So, so taking our cue from that rat and thinking about what what is a cognitive glue mechanism that we already know about? How do you encode memories in a collective of cells in a group of cells? We started thinking about uh, uh, electrophysiology. So, in the brain, which is the, maybe the only uh, sort of uh, un, un, uh, uncontroversial example of a biological system that has goals and pursues uh, navigational policies and space and so on. The way that works is with this electrical network. You have ion channels in the membrane. They set a voltage gradient, which may or may not be propagated to their neighbors. And as a result, so, so that's what the hardware looks like. The software looks like this. Um, this, this group that made this amazing video of a um, uh, zebrafish brain uh, uh, of a living zebrafish brain processing information. And it's the commitment of neuroscience that all of the animals' uh, cog cognition, so the memories, the goals, the preferences, the behavioral repertoires, everything, is encoded in this real-time electrophysiology. And then there's this process of neural decoding, where if we understood how to decode this information, we would have access to the mental content of that animal. So all of the goals and, and memories and so on are to be decoded from this kind of uh, electrophysiology. So it turns out that every cell in your body does this. All cells have ion channels. Uh, most cells have electrical connections to their neighbors. Uh, you can use the same techniques. So, so we developed some of these uh, um, uh, voltage imaging techniques in non-neural non cells. This is a frog embryo uh, uh, developing. So you can watch all the electrical conversations that these cells are having with each other as it figures out who's going to be left, who's going to be right, um, top, bottom, and so on. And, uh, and so you can imagine doing the same kind of neural uh, non-neural decoding. You can ask, what, what is this? We, we know what these networks are thinking about. They're thinking about movements through space. What are these networks thinking about? And so uh, what we can do if we take seriously this uh, kind of uh, uh, isom, um, you know, this, this, this um, invariance between uh, uh, neural and non-neural processes, because of course, 
the, uh, the, the non-neural bioelectricity has been around way longer. It was uh, discovered by evolution at, around the time of bacterial biofilms. It's an ancient form, and probably this is where the brain learned its tricks. Whereas the brain uses electrical networks to move, to, to command muscles, to move you through three-dimensional space, what, that system, what, what this whole, this whole uh, amazing system um, evolved from was a much earlier system that looks exactly the same way, but it was non-neural cells using electrical networks to tell all cells what to do to, make your, to move your body configuration in morphous space. Right? Coming back to this idea that, that, that evolution pivots. So, so you had electrical networks that were good at navigating morphogenetic space, and then nerves and muscles come on the scene, and now you can sort of pivot all of that, um, speed up the time considerably, but then now move you through three-dimensional space. And, and so on. So, so, so this is uh, the, 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 this is, uh, this is what we've been, what we've been working on. And in order to do that, we developed the first tools to, to read the, uh, the bioelectric, uh, uh, the contents of this, of this medium of this, of this collective intelligence. Um, and we also do a lot of uh, computer simulations of uh, both the genetics and then the, uh, the ion channel function and the, the electric uh, gradients and so on. And also trying to link it to work in, uh, in, in connectionist ideas of how, uh, how networks uh, uh, can, you know, the artificial neural networks can store memories and so on. So um, I want to show you a couple of what these patterns look like. This is of a, another voltage sensitive fluorescent dye. And this is a time lapse movie of a frog embryo putting its face together. And what you can see is that uh, before the genes come on that regionalize the, the face, this is one frame out of that movie. You can already see, okay, he, here is, uh, and the reason I'm showing you this one is it's one of the few cases where it's actually pretty obvious how to, how to decode it. Usually it's not. Uh, here's the mouth. Here's the animal's right eye. Here's where the placodes are going to go. All of the structure, the regionalization of the face is all ready to be read out in this very subtle uh, bioelectrical scaffold that directs gene expression and anatomy downstream. How do we know it directs? I'm going to show you that in a minute. So uh, these are all techniques for reading this stuff, and that's all well and good. But more important than that is the ability to do the opposite, which is to write. It's to write information, basically to incept false memories into that collective intelligence of cells and see if we can get them to build something different. And how do we do that? Well, we don't use any applied fields. There are no electrodes, there are no magnets, no electromagnetic waves, radiation, nothing like that. What we do is we target the native interface that these cells present to each other to control each other's behavior. And that interface is ion channels and gap junctions. So basically we steal all of the tools of neuroscience this, started, this is optogenetics, um, ion channel drugs, um, uh, various, various uh, ways to, uh, to, to, to uh, modify these channels and so on, uh, in, and going all the way up to all the conceptual apparatus, so perceptual control theory, active inference, uh, all, all of the, you know, by, by stability in the, in the uh, perceptual visual system and so on. All of these things carry over nicely. And so you can imagine if the tools and the concepts don't really tell the difference between neural and non-neural, uh, some of our distinctions between the journals and funding bodies and, and, uh, and so on between developmental biology and neuroscience are, are quite artificial, I think, um, and, and, and need, to be, need to be softened. Those barriers definitely need to be softened. So I want to show you some examples. So, so I showed you um, that, that frog face that has a very particular bioelectrical pattern that, uh, that, says, that uh, corresponds to where the eye is going to go, yeah, that, that electric, uh, electric face pattern. So what we did was we took uh, ion channel RNA that... Um, encoded a, a set of uh, potassium channels that can uh, could, uh, drive cells to that electrical state. And we injected them into the early embryo, targeting some cells that, for example, are going to be gut. And when you do that, uh, sure enough, those cells happily make an eye. And those eyes can have all the right lens and retina and optic nerve and all, all the right components. So notice a few interesting things here. First of all, the bioelectric state is instructive. So we didn't just screw up the face by, by messing with the electrical pattern. No, this is actually a gain of function experiment where you can induce an entire organ with this, with this signal. So it's instructive for organ type. It's extremely modular because we didn't put in enough information to tell it how to build an eye. Right? So, so the traditional thing, you would have to control all the stem cell differentiation and all the gene expressions and, and, and morphogenesis. We didn't control any of that. This is a high level subroutine call. Um, and we just said build an eye here, and we 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 uh, take advantage of the competency of the system to react to that stimulus and to and to build an eye downstream. Uh, we show um, a higher a competency of the tissues because actually the the textbook will tell you that only these cells up here are competent to make an eye, 
And the reason they say that is because they use a genetic um, uh, a prompt we're using a gene, a massive so-called master eye gene called PAC6. And if you do that, yeah, all, you can only get eyes back here, nowhere else. But if you, if, you, if you use a higher level prompt, which is the voltage, you can actually get eyes anywhere, um, anywhere in, the, in, the, in the animal. So, so your view of the competency of the system is only as good as your understanding of, of, of uh, the, various, uh, the various prompts. And I use that, that word, you know, somebody said, we're going to talk about AI later. So I use that, that word um, you know, on purpose. I really think that um, you know, uh, when, when, you, when you estimate the intelligence of some system, you're really taking an IQ test yourself. All, all you're saying is, this is what I've realized the system is able to do. And you might be, you might be leaving a lot on the, on the, on the table. Um, and, and finally, the other cool thing about this is, so, so this is a cross-section through uh, a, a lens sitting out in the tail somewhere of a tadpole. Um, and uh, what you'll notice is the blue cells are the ones that we actually injected with our channel that say build an eye. All of these other clear cells were never injected by us at all. And why are they here? Because these guys somehow realize there's not enough of them to build a whole lens. And what they do is they recruit their neighbors. So if you only get a few, they, they recruit their neighbors. And this is familiar to, to, to people who study other kinds of collective intelligences, such as ants and, and, and uh, termites, which will also recruit their, their buddies when they come across something that they can't handle um, you know, with, with just a few of them. So this, this, this ability to, to recruit. So, so look, we, we, we trigger this organ formation. We don't have to provide the details. That's already there in the system. We don't have to tell it how to recruit or to do size control or any of that. All of it is baked in already to the competency of the system. We are finding high-level hooks into the interpretation of machinery that says uh, that that says uh, build an eye or build a leg or whatever. I don't have time to show you um, all all the other things that uh, that, that we've built. Uh, I, I, I want to take a couple minutes and and uh, really really hammer this idea of the bioelectric uh, medium as the cognitive, um, the, the holder of the cognitive information, the memories of this collective intelligence, because I mean that quite, quite literally. So I wanna talk about planaria for a couple of minutes. So, um, so here's this flatworm, uh, these planaria, the, the amazing thing about them is that you can cut them into many pieces. Each piece will regenerate into a perfect little worm. They're also immortal, highly cancer resistant, uh, have an incredibly chaotic genome. That, that's a whole other thing we could, we could talk about at some point. Um, but they do have this, this uh, uh, amazing regenerative property. And so you might ask this question, uh, you've got this little fragment, it's got two wounds, one on the back, one on the front. How does it know how many heads it should have? Okay. And so, so we were studying this question and we realized that there was, a, there was actually a bioelectrical gradient in the fragment that uh, was able to, to, to uh, acquire different voltage patterns and tell each wound whether it should be a head or a tail. And you can, you can once you know that circuit, you can, you can uh, perturb it and you can do something like this. So here's a one-headed planarian. The anterior genes are in the head where they're supposed to be. And here's a nice one-headed worm. And normally that happens about 100% of the time. It's very reliable. Uh, now here's a one-headed, anatomically one-headed animal, anterior genes expressed in the head, not in the tail. And when you cut this guy, he suddenly makes a two-headed worm. This isn't Photoshop. This is this is a real animal. Uh, now, now, how did this happen? I just told you that this process is very reliable. Well, it happened because what we did was uh, we we took um, we took this one, and here's the here's the bioelectric pattern: one head, one one tail. And we we edited it to by using uh, ion channel drugs uh, guided by a computational model to 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 uh, to say no actually you this is the pattern you should have and it's kind of a mess the technology is still very very uh, much being worked out but you can see two what what it says is two heads and when you cut this animal sure enough it makes two heads now this is really critical this voltage map is not a map of this two-headed animal this voltage map is a map of this seemingly anatomically and molecularly normal one-headed creature. So a single-headed body can store up to two, probably a lot more, but we've nailed down two, two distinct representations of what a correct planarian is supposed to look like. There is your set point. When I claimed at the beginning that this um, uh, regenerative repair process is literally a homeostatic process with an encoded set point that's, that uh, determines anatomy, it's not merely feed-forward emergence. It actually has a goal state that it's going for, this is it. We can actually read it out now. We can literally read it and we can revise it um, in, in situ. And you might imagine that, uh, you know, brains give us this, this amazing uh, uh, capacity called uh, time, mental time travel, the ability to imagine things that are not happening right now. So you can remember things from the past. You can imagine things in the future, things that are not happening right now. So this could perhaps be a simple basal version of that because this pattern here 
is a latent memory. It's not true now. It says two heads, but this animal doesn't have two heads. It's not true right now. It is a representation of, it's a counterfactual. What will happen if I get injured in the future? If I get injured in the future, I will build two heads. Until then, I stay like this, right? So this is not a current descriptor. This is a, uh, a, a future for looking representation. Now, why do I keep calling this thing a memory? Uh, because it uh, fulfills the, the, all the properties of memory. So if I, uh, if I cut this, uh, if I cut this animal, uh, so I cut off the primary head, I uh, cut off the ectopic secondary head, you have this little middle line fragment, uh, what will happen to it in plain water? No more manipulations, just you know, what will happen to it? Now, you might think you've gotten rid of the ectopic tissue. You, um, uh, we haven't edited the genome. The genome is completely wild type, and you might think, well, surely it will just go be back to being one-headed. And that, in fact, is not what happens because the number of heads you're supposed to have is not, is not fully nailed down by your genetics. What your genetics does is gives you a machine that by default settles on the idea of uh, when, once the juice is turned on it, it, during, uh, during uh, development, it settles on the idea of having one head, but that isn't permanent, can be literally reprogrammed. And once reprogrammed, it holds that information and it holds and it holds and it holds. And you can keep cutting these. Uh, we don't think there's any limit. It just stays two-headed permanently. Um, although we can force it back to one headed. And here you can see these, uh, you can see these two headed uh, animals hanging around. And so, so this electrical pattern memory, so, so the collective intelligence of morphogenesis has a memory that is long-term stable, but it is rewritable. It has conditional recall. I showed you that on the previous slide. And it has a couple of discrete possible behaviors as two headed and one headed. And you know, this, this is one of those examples of why the, um, the, the conceptual piece really matters for discovery because the first two-headed worms were seen at the beginning of the 1900s, I think 1903 or 1905 or something. Since then, not until 2009, when we did it, as far as I know, has anybody recut a two-headed worm to see what would happen? Because people thought it was pretty obvious what would happen, right? You know what the genetics are. Of course, it'll go back to normal. So, so, so thinking about these things in different ways actually suggests new experiments um, that you can do. And not only uh, does this, pa does the, this uh, control the number of heads, it actually controls the, uh, the shape of the heads. So you, what you can do is you can take this nice uh, uh, triangular shaped uh, planarian species, cut off the head, uh, perturb the bioelectrical circuit that controls head development, and you can get them to build flat heads like this P. felina, round heads like this S. mediterranea, or of course the, the normal heads, uh, all without touching the genome. The hardware is unchanged, this is all uh, and, and by the way, so um, the, uh, the shape of the brain, the distribution of stem cells all become like these other species between 100 and 150 million years evolutionary distance between them. So this hardware is perfectly happy to visit other attractors in morphospace that are normally occupied by, by default by these other species. It's perfectly happy to go there if you convince it that that's where it needs to navigate to. So this, this idea of reprogrammability um, I think is, 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 is really powerful. And uh, I don't have time to show you all the, all the kind of biomedical stuff, but the bottom line, but you can, you, can sort of, you can sort of catch it here if you're interested, but the bottom line is that there are these uh, kind of bottom up techniques that are used in molecular medicine, which really focus on the machine aspect of life and all of the low level phenotypes, this, basically the symptoms uh, to, uh, to, to really try to micromanage what's going on. But there are all these top down approaches having to do with rewriting set points and training cells and, and tissues and so on to uh, uh, really take advantage of the, of the software of life and of the, of the agency that's there in terms of having memories and trying to uh, repair things. And, 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 and of course, informally, we already take, take advantage of this. I have, I have another slide that I show sometimes of uh, a, uh, an orthopedic surgeon in the first phase is he's got the, the person's arm opened up and he's using hammer and chisels and screwing nails. And I mean, this is very machine-like stuff, um, very sort of bottom up. But then afterwards, they sew it up and they say, now go home and heal. And what's that? Well, when you go home and heal, what you're really, uh, what you're really taking advantage of is, is, is all of this and the ability of, of your body to, uh, to, to take into account all these changes and come back into homeostasis in ways that we cannot um, micromanage. And I think that um, future, future medicine is going to look a lot more like a kind of uh, somatic psychiatry than it's going to look like chemistry. That's, um, that, that's, that's my thought. Okay, so this last bit, um, I want to... Uh, uh, just talk a little bit about uh, about the scaling of of, of selves, um, and one of the ways uh, that I think about selves is of a of a system that uh, that has a cognitive light cone. What's a cognitive light cone? It is the the size in the sort of like almost Minkowski diagram, right? Space, three dimensions of space, one of time. This this idea that 
uh, the, the, the size of the largest goal that you can represent. So you can imagine um, ticks and bacteria and things like that are, are really basically just managing very local, tiny little goals, you know, the local sugar concentration or butyrate, things like that. And you can have other creatures that have a much bigger cognitive light cone, but you're, as far as we know, um, your dog is never going to have a goal about what happens three weeks from now, two towns over. It's just not capable of having these large scale goals. Humans, of course, can have, can have massive cognitive light cones. You may can be working towards uh, world peace uh, and, and the financial markets 100 years from now and whatever. And, and of course, we are a compound intelligence because we are made of other systems that have their own cognitive light cones in their own spaces. So we're working with this idea that, that really a self is a model. It's a predictive metaphor which, which agents use to, uh, and they construct to relate to other systems, including themselves, and it has this, this uh, sort of three pieces. It has some sort of problem space. Uh, it has, a, uh, and it has a, a, a set of goals in a cognitive light cone that determines the size of those goals and some uh, competencies to, uh, to solve those goals. And let's just uh, look carefully again at how we get here, how we, uh, how we arise in, in the world. This is, a, this is an embryonic blastoderm. Uh, it's a flat sheet of, uh, of I don't know, 50,000 cells or so at this point. And we look at that and we say, oh, look, there's an embryo. And now, you might ask yourself, what are you counting when you say there's one embryo? Is it because there's 50,000 cells. What is there one of? What there's one of is alignment. It's alignment of the fact that, that left to its own devices, all of these cells will cooperate to build exactly this. They are all aligned towards the same goal. <clears throat> there's a there's a similar question you might ask about the brain. If you didn't already know what a human was, you might hold up a brain and you might say, hey, uh, how many individuals fit in this thing? And we actually have no idea because we, you know, unlike in computer science, where you know exactly how much information fits into a particular microchip here, you, you really don't know what the density of the medium is, uh, it, it, we, you know, how, how, how much of it is, is required to, to maintain a particular uh, type of self. And the thing about these embryos is that if you take a little needle and make some scratches in that blastoderm, and I did this, this stuff as a grad student. Uh, here's a here's a duck uh, embryo with with uh, two two twins. What happens is that each one of these regions, for the next four to six hours before it heals up, they don't feel the presence of the others. They decide that they are the only embryo, and they form an embryo, and then eventually it heals, and you have these conjoined twins. And so so and then there's some interesting questions about uh, the the borders, right? So we, as an embryo, where do I end and the outside world begins? Right here, here are um, every cell has some other cell for a neighbor. Where are my borders uh, as a, as a, as a self? And uh, so the number of individuals that emerge from this excitable medium is not fixed by the genetics. It could be zero, one, or probably up to half a dozen uh, or more of individuals that could come out of this. And this, of course, and the same thing. Uh, is uh, we, we have the exact same problem in neuroscience, of course, because we think we are sort of a unified intelligence, but we have data from split brain patients and dissociative identity disorders. It's entirely unclear how many uh, selves are actually in a brain at any given time. And so that means that this scale up of the cognitive light cone from the tiny little goals of individual amoeba to the massive uh, anatomical goals of, uh, of, of multicellular organisms, that scale up is not just an evolutionary thing. It can change the border between yourself and the outside world can shift. So, so this, and, and the failure mode of this process is cancer. So here, this is human glioblastoma cells can disconnect from the network that binds them towards these larger goals. And then they basically revert back to their local amoeba, uh, little tiny goals, which is proliferation, migration. Uh, and, and as far as they're concerned, the rest of the body is just external environment. So these cells are not more selfish as is sometimes modeled in game theory models of cancer. They're not more selfish. They just have smaller selves. So that border between self and world has shrunk. And whereas all of these cells are working towards this, this quite grandiose goal, these guys have little tiny amoeba scale goals. And of course, um, we have uh, some, some computational efforts to try and understand how collectives of cells in electrical networks scale their goals, right? How, how these homeostatic loops scale. And again, thinking in that, in that way leads to, um, uh, leads to, uh, Specific to, to, to therapeutics, which is that, you know, here's the, you can, you can see when you, when we put in an, a human oncogene and they make a tumor, uh, and uh, you can, you can already see that, that, that these cells before the tumor is apparent, these cells are already disconnecting from their neighbors. And so the therapeutics that are suggested here is unlike chemotherapy, which seeks to kill the cells, what if we force them to remain in electrical connection with their neighbors? So the, these are the same animals. So here's the oncoprotein blazingly expressed 
Uh, and in fact, there doesn't have to be a tumor here because, because it's not the genetics, it's the physiology that drives. And if you force these cells to be connected, even though they have this DNA uh, defect, um, they will continue cooperating towards making a nice liver and so on. Okay. Um, and, uh, the, and the very final uh, thing I want to show is, is this idea of, you know, I told you about these, um, uh, these, these goal states, these set points that these systems have. But where do these set points come from? Where do these goals come from? And, and, and can we make some novel ones that have never been around before? And so, so here's, uh, here's some, uh, some, uh, some, some skin cells from a frog embryo. We're going to liberate them from the rest of the animal. Uh, we're going to dissociate them, put them in a little dish. They could die. They could spread out, get away from each other. They could form a two-dimensional monolayer. Instead, they do something very interesting here. They, they come together into this thing that we call a xenobot. Xenobot because Xenopus lavis is the name of the frog, and we think it's a biorobotics platform. So it starts to swim. It uses these little hairs, which are normally used to distribute mucus on the side of the frog. But now it's able to row against the water, right? So it, uh, so it swims. They can go in circles. They can go, but they can sort of patrol back and forth. They have all kinds of collectives, just tracking data. They can have all kinds of collective behaviors. Uh, here's one navigating a maze. So what it does is it, it goes for a while. It takes the corner without bumping into the opposite wall. And then at this point, some, for some internal reason we don't understand, it turns around and goes back where it comes from. So they have spontaneous behaviors. They have, uh, if, you, if you use the same technology, meaning uh, looking at um, calcium uh, signaling as you would do in brains, although remember, there are no neurons here. This is just skin. These are purely skin cells. Um, you can see a lot of these same dynamics. You can ask where you can use um, causal information theory to ask whether are they talking to each other? Are they integrated? We're, we're sort of, we're, we're, we're doing all that. Um, and they have this other uh, amazing uh, property, which is we call kinematic replication. So we've made it impossible for these guys to, uh, uh, to reproduce in the normal froggy fashion. And uh, instead, what happens is if you provide them with, a, with, with loose material, so this white stuff is just loose skin cells, what they do is they run around, they collect these skin cells into a little ball, and they sort of polish it like this. And then because they're dealing with the same agential material that we, as, as the engineers, were dealing with, they, uh, these little balls become the next generation of xenobots. And guess what they do? They mature, and they run around, and they make the next one. So this is kind of this, this von Neumann's idea of a, of a robot that makes copies of itself by stuff it finds in the external environment. Um, so, so the wild thing about this is that you might think we didn't, we didn't, uh, there, there are no chemicals, there are no synthetic biology circuits, no nanomaterials. All we did was liberate these cells from the normal uh, uh, instructive uh, signals from the other cells that make them, they, they basically are bullied into having a boring two dimensional life as the skin of an organism. In the absence of that, now you get to see what they really want to do. What they really want to do is this. And uh, you might ask what, the, what evolution learned when it made the frog genome. Well, you know it learned, the default is what you see all the time is that it learned this developmental sequence and then it makes tadpoles, but it also has this and who knows what else it has. We haven't even, I think, scratched the surface. These xenobots have their own crazy developmental sequence. Eventually, um, they have these weird behaviors. And what's wild is that they do not have a straightforward evolutionary backstory. There was never selection to be a good xenobot. There have never been any xenobots. There's never been selection for kinematic self-replication. So you, you might ask, the, I mean, the cells obviously were, were part of the evolutionary stream that produced the frog, but, but, but you might ask, wh where do these things um, come from? And we actually don't know what their cognitive capacities are. We're, we're doing work now to, can they learn? Do they, you know, do they remember their environment and so on? Uh, and, so, and, so, and so we learned something interesting when we, um, uh, when we, when we probe the, the, the plasticity of, of these kind of processes. But we are not the only ones that know how to do this. So the human engineers are not the only ones who do, who do this. This works only because biology hacks itself all the time. So you might think that you know what oak uh, genomes do. They produce uh, these leaves, nice, flat, with a specific structure. They, so so this, is what, this is what the oak genome does. But if, if these cells are prompted by an expert uh, bioengineer, which happens to be this wasp, they, these exact same cells can produce these galls. So these are plant galls. They're produced not by the wasp, they're produced by the, by the plant cells. And you would have no idea that these flat uh, green things could produce something crazy like this if you didn't have this example of the parasite hacking the competency, the morphogenetic competency. So, and so what we think actually is these, these kinds of synthetic uh, um, uh, objects like, like these xenobots are really a kind of periscope. They're a way to uh, kind of kind of stick your head into the into the latent space of possibilities around the con the conventional thing that you see all the time and 
uh, using uh, low agency interventions like chemical signals and then uh, some medium agency things like parasites and, and, and bacteria and then higher agency tools like scientists you you can you can use these synthetic beings to look at the um, at the at the normally invisible option space of what's around and so I'm just going to close up here by pointing out out that because of the fact that because evolution makes problem solving machines, not just solutions to specific problems, it is life is incredibly interoperable. And all of Darwin's uh, sort of endless forms, most beautiful, all of the natural forms are like this tiny blip in this enormous option space of novel bodies and novel minds. Uh, just about every combination of evolved material, designed, uh, you know, engineered material and software is going to be some kind of agent. So you've got cyborgs and hybrids, and they may, may, many of these already exist, but, but certainly in the next couple of decades, we are going to be surrounded by creatures that are nowhere with us on the tree of life that have radically different bodies and minds. We need to develop new systems uh, of a kind of ethical synthbiosis where it's, you, you can't tell how you're going to relate to something the way we used to do, which is by, just by asking what is it made of and how did it get here, right? So composition and origin story, you know, evolve versus design. That is not going to work anymore. Those things are going to be out the window. We need to do way better than that. So um, I'm going to stop here and thank uh, the postdocs and uh, the students who did all the work, um, our collaborators, uh, our, our various funders who support this. I have to do three disclosures. So there are three companies that, uh, that support us. And uh, I always thank the, uh, the model systems because they do all the heavy lifting in teaching us about what's possible. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. Wow, that was, that was amazing. It was really, really cool and mind-blowing stuff. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. And um, I think I'm going to leave the YouTube channel open for quite a while. I, I, I feel like there's going to be quite a few questions, but oh, um, well, I forgot. But yeah, let us thank Mike <laughs> for, for this. Thank you so much. Amazing thank talk. And so, uh, so this is how we're going to do the question session. Uh, I think uh, whoever wants to ask a question, you can raise your hand in the chat. You're also welcome to write your question in the chat and I can relay them to Mike. Uh, and then I think I'm going to keep the, 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 the question session open longer uh, on YouTube. And I think we're going to have a lot of interesting discussions and I would like to keep that uh, recorded and uh, for, for future references, uh, if, if that's okay with you, Mike. Sure. Yeah, yeah, sure. And so I think we have one question from David, David Spivak. I'm going to, uh, you can unmute yourself. Great. Right, thanks, Shelley. Thanks for the talk, Mike. It was great as usual. Um, so it kind of seems like what evolution does is it, we, we cultivate strategies. We have a collection of strategies as our genome or in society, as society evolves, we cultivate strategies like how you build an oil well or how you, you know, in, in protein, how you build this protein, blah, blah, blah. We cultivate these strategies and we have libraries of them. And then uh, it seems like a common goal that just is, is proved that these strategies work together. So the Xenobot is like, hey, I've got some things I can do. I've got hairs and, you know, I've got this ability to blah, 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 whatever it has. And it, and it just kind of, what does it do? Well, it just starts being agential like that. I guess I'm wondering, um, mainly I'm, I'm wondering like whether you think that that's a valid kind of look at what you're saying that, that, that in all, at all levels we're cultivating strategies and uh, using them to kind of prove our ability to move through either morpho or bio, you know, any kind of space. And then I was also wondering if, you, if that would suggest um, in terms of like cultivating strategies within our domain of say proving theorems in a in a library of you know we've got this library of of strategies so far all these lemmas and we want to prove we want to prove that we we can want to prove to ourselves we can prove new theorems um, whether you think that like ideas from um, or I've got this programming library and I want to prove that I can like solve this new programming task um, that do you think that like that the analogy would be strong there that it, maybe it's missing something. And that do you think there'd be any lessons from, from biology that would tell us like how we would strategize for credit assignment so that um, we'd be most efficient at like building these, uh, you know, proving new theorems, et cetera. Yeah, yeah, boy, um, well, that's sort of right on the edge. So, so there's nothing I can say uh, that's definitive there, but I, I, I do think that we can, especially in our work uh, on, um, Trying to trying to cash out uh, uh, language and speech generation as a kind of navigation, I would I would bet that you can you can do the same kind of thing in theorem proving space. I mean I don't know I'm hardly a, you know an expert on any of that, but 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 I would I would bet that 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 you can you can um, model that as a navigation task as well. In which case 
I, I do think that you can use a lot of the um, uh, basic skills that we see. I mean, one, one basic strategy that we see in this in, in biology is this uh, multi-scale architecture where what you really have are a collection of subunits with their own agendas. And the higher level system has to, has to uh, basically bend the perception space of these subunits so that whatever they know how to do ends up serving the higher goal. So I could imagine this, I'm just totally fantasizing here, but I could imagine that in proving theorems, you could decompose the problem into sub problems, right? And so in such an architecture, and in fact, um, uh, my, um, a student and I are actually working on a on a, uh, a software system like this that that we call uh, goal directed programming, where where what you try to do is is uh, it's, you you try to have it automatically uh, try to have su subunits try to to grab little little pieces of the problem that they can solve and then offer them up to see if if a higher level system can do anything with that and then there's kind of a reward currency and all that. So so yeah, I think I think that that, that aspect of biology, the fact that every level has a set of agendas that often co compete. By the way, sometimes they cooperate, sometimes they compete, um, and so on. I think I think that kind of thing could be could be used uh, in in some kind of proving task. And do you feel like you have the credit assignment aspect? Do you think you have good insights into it based on what you know, or just that there must be one? Uh, we, I think we barely, I mean, I, we, we have a few insights, but I don't think we've cracked it at all. I think, I think there's a much deeper thing that we've barely begun to, uh, you know, one, one of the, one of the biggest, uh, one of the biggest mysteries still that I think uh, has many implications is that we now from, from that barium experiment that I, that I told, I talked about at the beginning, we have some idea that cells can actually figure out which genes are involved in whatever physiological stressor they might be having. Okay. And how that happens, I haven't a clue. It's, it's an incredibly hard um, inverse problem, but if it's true that that cells can do that, that is a credit assignment trick that I think if we understood that it would, you know, AI would, would be catapulted, I, I think, but, but we don't know how it works. Like I have no idea how it works. Great. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, Mike. Um, so we have two questions, um, Yanis from Yanis and then later Mikhail. So I'll ask Yanis's question first. He said, uh, thank you, Michael. From the last piece of your talk, it seems like the human self is created at the conception, but then it keeps changing dynamically. So would you be reductionist and claim that the self is the bio biology or the self is mostly the sociological addition to a biological self? So, so what I would say is that I, I, I don't think, so, so, so no, I, I, I'm not a reductionist on this topic, uh, but, but I would point out that I, I, in, in my view, the self is not an objective, um, the, you know, uh, existing thing that we have to say, how did it get here? I, I think the self is a model in the eye of an observer. So, so and, and, and that means that there will be multiple observers with different views of the self. So, so if you are an observer whose job it is to, to deal with a morphogenetic, uh, you know, uh, uh, journey of that self, you might be some kind of regenerative medicine worker and your model might really focus on the biology of it. If, 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 if you are somebody who's trying to um, gather uh, uh, these selves into some kind of uh, uh, structure, you might be very interested in what the, what the social component is. If you're, if you're somebody who makes uh, prosthetics for um, for people for sensory um, augmentation and 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 you know and, and and so on, you will have an intermediate view where the border of the self is certainly not stopping at the skin, but it is also maybe not as wide as society. You know, you're saying, okay, here's somebody that's plugged in. He has a primary sense of the stock market, and he can you know do certain. So so, so there might be a bigger self. So so where you place that uh, that border of the self is up to you as an external observer, and of course as you as yourself, because you have to have a picture of yourself as well for deciding what you're going to do. So so that move from your current self to your to your future self will be guided very strongly by your own model of what you are and where the boundary between you and the outside world is. So so the self is is a, is is not one thing. It's a, you know it's it's a model in the mind of some other agent or or yourself. Thank you, thank you, Mike. Thank you, Yanis, for that question. Uh, so I, I see that we have a raised hand from Mikhail. Uh, Mikhail, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah, given that you focus on memory and goals uh, and changing them, the natural question would be, what is the best language to express these programs, right? Uh, so 
are you happy with differential equations or do you think like Petri networks or neural networks? Because the question here is like how to express this mathematics in an accessible abstract yeah. way instead of getting bogged into, into details, right? Certainly yeah. this is not kind of a machine with a single decision point, right? Yeah. Yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely true. Uh, and we actually we actually have a paper on on a P systems model of it from some years ago. But overall, I think that that no, we, we, we don't have a good formalism. People have proposed, you know, Robert Rosen they had a uh, had a kind of a M systems and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I, the most useful thing that I see right now is the active inference framework from uh, from from folks like Carl Friston and Gio Pizzullo and so on. Uh, that seems to be, you know, focusing on the agent's uh, ability to um, try to predict its own next sensory state, to to focus on the agent's perception of a of a problem landscape. Th that kind of language, I think, is going to be fundamental. Uh, and and the other stuff uh, like uh, uh, you know um, uh, differential equations and all the other things that we use are going to be derivative of that. I think we fundamentally need to take the perspective of the agent. And and ask and 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 some you know if 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 you're dealing with a bowling ball on a landscape, pretty much you just need to watch the landscape and you'll know everything that's going to happen. But if you're dealing with a mouse on the landscape, your view of that landscape isn't nearly as important as the mouse's perception of that landscape because he has a completely different energy surface in terms of he may prefer certain things, he may have had a bad experience in one end of it, and so so for some for some uh, uh, the, the the sort of the more complex you get in biology, the more you have to pay attention to what does the agent actually see? What does he measure? What, um, what, what is he trying to minimize or maximize? What does he believe? And so on. Uh, and so I think we need a formalism for that. And I mean, active inference does pretty well, but we have to, we have to go further, I think. Uh, thank you, Mike. Thank you, uh, Mikhail, for your question. Uh, David, I see that your hand is up again. Uh, feel free to unmute yourself. Yeah, I figured I would just... Uh... As long as if there's no one else who has a question, I certainly have more. Um, so under this kind of analogy, so you say that all intelligence is collective intelligence. Um, and so under this analogy of say from human society as a collective versus uh, say um, a cell society as a collective, you've shown that like bioelectric fields are ways we can talk to a cell collective and say, hey, there's supposed to be an eye here. And um, just, since I'm not a biologist at all, I'm wondering, like, under that analogy, if you looked at human collectives, um, what would the analog of bioelectric fields be? And how would it feel to be in the presence of one? Um, and how would it kind of guide us to solve the, like, what would the goal that it presented us feel like in our, in our, under that analogy? Yeah. Um... So, so I can I can say a couple. Of, I mean, mostly we don't know, but but uh, but I can say a couple of things. One is that uh, it's a really interesting problem to ask whether a subunit it can can tell that it's part of a another intelligence, right? Can you now? Now, my my guess is there's some sort of girdle limit of knowing exactly what that intelligence is doing and so on. But but could you, as a subunit, gain evidence that you're part of something else? And in fact, I have I have this um, uh, amazing uh, a graphic artist that that works with me and makes a lot of uh, figures. And I had him make up a a kind of a cartoon where uh, there are these 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 two neurons in a brain, and the one neuron is a kind of a, a materialist, and this says. Uh, you know, the universe is a cold, uh, uncaring place. It doesn't, uh, there's no agency there. It doesn't care what we do. And, and the other neuron is like, no, but I, I, it's a little more mystic, you know, of a mystic. And he says, well, I kind of have this feeling that, that we're part of something bigger that, that has, uh, you know, goals and memories. And I can't prove it, but you know, these, these, these waves of, of back propagation that come through us. And I feel like we're being rewarded or punished for something. And the first one says, ah, you're crazy. It's just, you know, random. And so, and so obviously in that system, right, the second one is, is, is correct, but I wonder, like to what extent could we actually tell? So, so and, and I don't know, and what techniques could we use to, to gain evidence that we're part of something bigger? That's, so that's, that's, that's one thing. The other thing is, uh, I don't think there's any particular guarantee that when subunits uh, come together into a larger system, that the IQ of the larger system is greater than that of the subunits, right? I think that it will work in a different space but I'm not sure there's, that depending on what kind of um, connection policies you're using, I'm not sure there's any guarantee that a, that a collective is necessarily smarter than, you know, I mean, in biology, we sort of see that it typically is, but, 
I, I don't know that we can guarantee that. And I, and I don't think that we know the optimal uh, connection policies to make that go. I mean, sometimes people will say, one thing I, I always have to be careful of, people see that cancer story, and I sometimes I do a whole hour, you know, talk on cancer, and they see that, that, that cancer story that in order to not have a tumor and to have a nice organ, the cells have to be coupled electrically, and, and people extrapolate that to the social level, and they say, oh, Super. So, so we should just, you know, connect ourselves with these gap junctions. I mean, part of it is you, you lose your part of the scaling mechanism is that you share memories, which basically wipes a lot of your personal identity because, because once you and I are connected by this gap junction, we basically share the same engrams your memories are my memories. And now we can't defect from each other and so on. I mean, that's all well and good and for, for, for cancer prevention, but, but um, people say, okay, that's great. We'll, we'll come up with some sort of social mechanism to just like gap junction ourselves together and we'll all be one giant, you know, Borg collective or something. And I, I, you know, I, I point out that there is absolutely no guarantee because we don't have a good science of knowing what these collective intelligences uh, are capable of, what their goals are going to be. We have, we have no clue. And um, uh, because of that, there's no guarantee that this collective is going to have anything uh, in mind that are good for any of the subunits. And we actually, in biology, you know, if, if, if you go, um, I don't know, you go, you go and you, you do an afternoon of rock climbing and you have a wonderful time and you come back and many of your goals as a high, high entity uh, self are met, you left a bunch of skin on, on that rock and those cells, uh, you know, they, 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 they didn't volunteer for this and, and you didn't give them two thoughts. You just, you know, you scraped up your hands, you'll be fine as, as, a, as a high level collective, but those cells are dead. And so we have to be really careful about this because there's absolutely no guarantee that these um, larger collectives that we can connect ourselves to. And I mean, I think human history bears this out. This, this has been tried right a number of times. And I think, I think it bears this out that, that just doing that without a really good understanding of the optimal policy is not necessarily going to do anything that, that the, uh, that the subunits of the collective are going to thrive under. I think I, I just wanted to kind of, um, so I wasn't trying to suggest kind of a moral stance of, of like, maybe we could do this thing, it would be great in our society. I was more trying to understand what bioelectric fields are yeah. in some sense. Um, yeah. And so I might have mis, mis asked the question. What you said was interesting and, and I agree. And it sounds well, useful. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm asking I'm, like, if, if, I'm in a, if I'm in an organization and there's policy, say, and I, I know that if I violate the policy, it's not going to be good or that people are relying on the policy, would that be the sort of thing that's like analogous to bioelectric fields? Or like, I guess I'm, I'm wondering, are, is there anything at our level that would, would, feel, yeah. would, would feel to you appropriate as a way of thinking about what it's like to be in the presence of a bioelectric field? Yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not sure, but 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 we. I think we can start getting there if we think about what the what the what the bioelectric mechanisms actually do. So mm -hmm. let's 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 just consider um, the gap junction, right? What 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 the gap junction is doing? It's a it's a direct uh, portal from from one cell's internal milieu to another, and when it's open, and and so here's why that's magical because. If you just have two cells and this cell sends some kind of diffusive chemical signal and comes over and this cell senses it, it's very clear to the cell that that came from the outside. And so you can, you can ignore it, you can act on it, you can believe it, you can doubt it, whatever, but, but you know that that came from outside. As soon as these cells are connected and information can go from directly from one into the other, those chemical signals don't have metadata on them saying where they came from. So if something happens to cell A and the consequences appear in cell B, cell B has no way of knowing, wait, did that just happen to me or did that happen to you, right? Calcium signaling is calcium signaling. If I see a calcium spike, I, I might as well have been injured just like you were. And so in the end, what that does is that wipes the ownership information on memories. It means that you and I now share the same memories and that means that uh, it means a couple of things. It means, A, it's impossible for me to defect from you because we'll be in. And, and, and it also means that there is no me and you really. There's just we because because once once we share the same memories, it's very hard to retain um, identity. So I don't know what the exact analog of that would be. But the thing to look for is this kind of uh, blurring of uh, of boundaries. So like maybe mother. that's. A mother baby um, in the womb kind of thing might be maybe right. Maybe it's something that happens to be. I mean, I have no idea, but I hear that pe that that people who take certain psychedelics together feel like there's some sort of like blurring of the distinctions. I don't know, but uh, maybe there will be um, uh, 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 VRs, uh, certain VR prosthetics that uh, you sort of share brain states, right? And you sort of uh, it kind of wipes that. That that's the kind of thing you're you're looking for technologies or uh, social constructs that 
that wipe distinctions between individuals. That's that's a lot of what this thing is about. And, and then there are many other things. There are many other things about bioelectrics, but that's one that we can. I think we can start thinking about. Thanks. I like that. I I think it kind of reminds me of something from neuroscience where it says that or what fires together wires together, mm. and and that um and that maybe the the connection between the two parts becomes stronger and uh, more correlated or. Uh, you know, over time, and there could be mechanisms for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I think uh, we're going to have time for uh, one more question, and maybe I, I also want to ask a question on behalf of uh, everyone. Um, so the, the last question is from Constantine, and he says, uh, "Do you have do you see any relation between the planaria body plan and attractors of dynamical systems?" Yeah, yeah, I do. Uh, we 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 have made models, and and we need to do a lot more work on this of uh, caching out the different types of shapes as literally attractors in morphous space and mapping those attractors to attractors in the bioelectrical state space of the circuit that controls them. So that's how we've been thinking about them. Now, I, I don't know that that's the best way to think about it. There may be other things that we simply haven't uh, figured out yet, but for now, yeah, that seems like a very appropriate set of tools to me. Great, uh, thank you, uh, Mike. And so, uh, before the talk, I asked you a question about AI and AI safety. People have been thinking a lot about chat GPT uh, and other kinds of like, uh, you know, uh, AI systems. And we were talking about whether we could align them um, to human values. We can talk about uh, whether they're conscious. We we're talking about like, um, how do we keep, make them safe or how do you find out what's going on within them? So based on your work, um, I'm sure you have thought about these kinds of things as well. What, what are some of your views on, on, on what's going on in AI and what are the ways that we could solve some of the, the problems which are coming up right now? Yeah, um, well, let's see, there's a lot that could be said, but, but I'll, just, I'll just focus on this, on this one thing. Uh, and, and I'm in the, in the process of writing an essay on this, but it's not, it's not remotely finished. It's the idea that uh, a lot of the issues that we've been having, that we've been debating about AI, I think are really uh, just reflections of fundamental existential problems that humans have had forever. And it's just that now suddenly the average person is, you know, philosophers have been talking about this for a long time, but suddenly that now everybody's waking up to this, to these issues. So, so just for example, this issue of alignment, right? So we, we already, long before AI, we already have been producing high level uh, guaranteed high level agential intelligences, the children, the human children, and we produce them and we send them out into the world. S some of them get um, um, uh, trained and raised well. Some of them do not. Some of them have a wonderful upbringing. Some of them are, do not. Uh, we don't have any techniques for making sure that they are aligned. We don't have any techniques for making, you know, people, people worry about relevance. Um, you know, how do we stay relevant when AI is so good at things? This is, this has been with us since day one, you know, you make kids and you wonder like, are they going to care about any of the things that we care about? The next generation, you know, tends to think the old people are, you know, a bunch of irrelevant dummies, uh, well, you know, rightly or wrongly. And the, this issue of creating high level intelligence is that you, some of them will do wonderful things. Some of them will do horrific things, trying to align them. I mean, this has been with us forever. And, and, and this, is, this is not something that just popped up with AI. So I think to, the, to, to whatever extent uh, AI uh, is, is, is developed that actually has the, uh, the options, you know, a, rich, a rich option space, we're just simply going to, it's going to basically re resolve to the same thing we've been debating forever, which is what are good parenting policies uh, you know, how should we as a society regulate? I mean, for, for me to do an experiment on a frog egg, I need two months of review by, by a board at Tufts and there's ethics and, and you know, there's philosophers and, and veterinarians and all this stuff. But, but any two people can get together and make a baby. There is zero regulation of that. There's very loose kinds of um, control that society has about what happens afterwards. And so I actually think this whole alignment thing is a much bigger thing. I, I think people should spend much more time, less time on the alignment of the AIs and more time on figuring out how, how what, what are we going to do with the actual like high level agential intelligences that we produce all day long. So that's, that's just, you know, that's just one, one thing to say. Um, another thing to say is that um, uh, it used to be that the only things that talked were things that had really high agency. And that, but, but that was, as it turns out, I mean, that's an amazing thing that we've learned in the last, you know, few years is that that was just a, um, uh, 
I don't want to say coincidence, but it, but it wasn't fundamental. Now, now, actually, it turns out that that's not necessarily true. And we have things that can talk, uh, but, but actually do not have this, uh, this important um, uh, set of uh, uh, active inference loops that I think are really important for being an actual agent. We will. I don't think there's any reason why we can't. I think people, in fact, I know people are developing that, so we will. Uh, the, the, biggest, the biggest thing, I, I think the biggest cure for a lot of issues that we're having with these debates with AI is to become better, um, fam more familiar with the field of diverse intelligence. Because when people talk about AIs, they all they have in mind generally is comparison to human brains. And there is so much fundamentally alien intelligence around us in the various uh, different kinds of, um, you know, the pro like general intelligence in terms of problem solving is way older than brains. It's way older than, you know, than anything resembling a human. And so we really need to, uh, not focus on so much. Oh, they're not like humans. Yeah, they may not be like humans, but that doesn't mean anything. There are there are tons of intelligence that are nothing like humans, and so I, I really think uh, AI could strongly benefit from uh, from from more 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 conversations with the field of diverse intelligence. Even even that first slide I showed, where when you say, "Well, the human." What human? You can, the, you know, the, the the humans at the center of all these continua. You know, we, we have no idea. And then people argue, well, they don't. They, they're just a um, uh, they, they're they're just a a, a, a predictor a device. You know, they don't understand like I understand. All of that is 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 a problem only because we have no idea what we mean that we understand. Right? What what true understanding is? We have no no clue. There's no there, and um and and similarly say, oh well, GPT you know confabulates. Oh my God, I mean, you know, real, real, real uh, uh, cognitive agents confabulate all the time. Humans confabulate like crazy. It's a, it's a major part of being uh, an advanced agent is being able to tell stories about what happened when you have no idea what happened. And that's, that's baked into our, uh, you know, that's, that's baked into our um, cognitive system. And so, uh, yeah, that's, you know, those are just some, some loose ideas. There's, there's, there's plenty more. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mike. I'm, I'm really looking forward to the paper you're writing. And, and thank you for reminding us that these are HO questions and to look at diverse intelligence. So I think in the int interest of time, um, I'm going to stop uh, our Zoom call and our live stream here. I just want to thank you again, Mike. Thank you so much. And I think thank the you so much. audience as well really enjoyed the discussion at the end. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, yeah, thank uh, Cool. Uh, cool. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for, for having me on the great discussion. Um, uh, I know I didn't get to some of the chat questions. Uh, feel free to email me. Um, I'm around. I'm happy, happy to talk. All right, thank you. And uh, to, to, to everyone else, um, we have uh, Mike has two links to his website and to, um, to, to his work. Uh, I think it's called thought, thoughtforms.life. So feel, feel free to check it out for more information. And uh, thank, thanks once again, Mike. And uh, I will end the live stream here. Okay, see you, thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.